Hierbij I open this academic ceremony in which Lisette Bongers will defend the academic thesis moving towards a European convergence in classical individual patient rights. May I invite you to present the summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Thank you. Geachte meneer de prorector, geachte leden van de corona, beste promotoren. Lieve familie, vrienden en collega's, heel fijn dat jullie vandaag aanwezig zijn bij de openbaar verdediging van mijn proefschrift. Moving towards European Convergence in Classical Individual Patients Rights. In de komende 15 minuten zal ik jullie meer vertellen over het onderwerp van mijn promotieonderzoek en over de resultaten die uit mijn onderzoek naar voren zijn gekomen. In mijn promotieonderzoek staat de bescherming van patiëntenrechten in de Europese Unie centraal. Ik kijk specifiek naar de zogeheten klassieke individuele patiëntenrechten. Onder klassieke individuele patiëntenrechten versta ik de rechten van patiënten die van toepassing zijn op de relatie tussen zorgverlener en patiënt. Enkele voorbeelden zijn onder andere het recht van de patiënt op geïnformeerde toestemming, het recht om een negatieve schriftelijke wilsverklaring op te stellen en een dergelijke wilsverklaring houdt een behandelverbod in, waarin een patiënt duidelijk aangeeft niet behandeld te willen worden. Ook de rechten die verband houden met het medisch dossier zijn voorbeelden van klassieke patiëntenrechten waar wij als mensen allemaal mee te maken kunnen krijgen. Op internationaal niveau zijn de klassieke patiëntenrechten vastgelegd in verschillende verdragen. Ook de Europese Unie heeft ondanks haar beperkte juridische bevoegdheid op het gebied van de gezondheidszorg instrumenten opgesteld die van belang zijn voor klassieke patiëntenrechten. De fundamentele basis, waarden en beginselen van klassieke patiëntenrechten worden daarom gemeenschappelijk gedeeld door de lidstaten van de Europese Unie. Wanneer wij kijken naar de interpretatie en toepassing van de gemeenschappelijk gedeelde waarden en beginselen, zien wij echter dat er verschillen bestaan tussen de lidstaten. Het is namelijk primair aan de lidstaten zelf om een niveau van rechtsbescherming te bepalen dat zij wensen toe te kennen aan klassieke patiëntenrechten. Voor een patiënt kunnen deze nationale verschillen praktische en juridische problemen opleveren wanneer hij of zij ervoor kiest om voor behandeling naar een andere EU-lidstaat te reizen. In een situatie van grensoverschrijdende zorg is namelijk de wetgeving van de lidstaat waar de behandeling plaatsvindt van toepassing. Voor een patiënt betekent dit dus dat hij of zij met voor hem of haar onbekend buitenlands recht te maken zal gaan krijgen. Dit volgt uit de richtlijn van de Europese Unie betreffende de toepassing van de rechten van patiënten bij grensoverschrijdende gezondheidszorg. Deze patiëntenrichtlijn is in de eerste plaats ontworpen om de toegang tot veilige en hoogwaardige grensoverschrijdende zorg te vergemakkelijken voor individuele patiënten. En ook hier worden de nationale bevoegdheden voor het organiseren en verstrekken van gezondheidszorg volledig eerbiedigd. Om de problemen voor patiënten concreter aan te kunnen tonen, besteed ik in mijn proefschrift aandacht aan een fictieve casus. In deze casus overweegt een 68-jarige Nederlandse vrouw, Bella, voor medisch noodzakelijke orthopedische chirurgie naar een ziekenhuis in Duitsland of Hongarije te gaan. Zij heeft drie jaar geleden in het Nederlands een negatieve schriftelijke wilsverklaring opgesteld. En volgens de Nederlandse wet en regelgeving is haar wilsverklaring juridisch bindend voor de behandelende zorgverleners in Nederland. In haar wilsverklaring is Bella heel specifiek. Bij een hartstilstand na de orthopedische operatie weigert zij haar geïnformeerde toestemming voor levensreddende reanimatie. Een kopie van haar wilsverklaring is opgenomen in het medisch dossier dat wordt bijgehouden door haar huisarts en door de behandelend zorgverlener in een ziekenhuis in Nederland. Om ervoor te zorgen dat de behandelend zorgverleners in het buitenland ook toegang hebben tot haar wilsverklaring, heeft Bella geregeld dat zij in het bezit is van een afschrift van haar medische gegevens. Zij vraagt zich nu af of haar Nederlandse wilsverklaring 
ook in Duitsland en Hongarije opgevolgd zou worden door de daar behandelende zorgverleners. Een casus zoals deze van Bella kan iedere dag voorkomen in de praktijk van grensoverschrijdende zorg binnen de Europese Unie. De richtlijn waar ik eerder naar verwees bevat belangrijke bepalingen in hoofdstuk 2 die Bella kunnen helpen bij het beantwoorden van een vraag. De artikelen 4, 5 en 6 introduceren namelijk verantwoordelijkheden voor de lidstaat waar de patiënt verzekerd is en voor de lidstaat waar de behandeling plaatsvindt. Deze verantwoordelijkheden kunnen geïnterpreteerd worden als klassieke rechten en als nieuwe informatierechten, die patiënten in staat stellen een wel overwogen keuze te maken over het ontvangen van behandeling in een andere lidstaat. Artikel 6 is een van de belangrijkste bepalingen. Op grond van deze bepaling moet iedere lidstaat één of meer nationale contactpunten voor grensoverschrijdende zorg aanwijzen om patiënten informatie te geven over hun rechten. Voor mijn onderzoek is vooral lid 3 van dit artikel 6 belangrijk. Deze bepaling houdt een verantwoordelijkheid voor de lidstaat van behandeling in om ervoor te zorgen dat hun nationaal contactpunt aan patiënten informatie geeft, waaronder op verzoek van de patiënt informatie over patiëntenrechten op grond van hun wetgeving. In mijn proefschrift beargumenteer ik dat het begrip patiëntenrechten verwijst naar de klassieke individuele patiëntenrechten. En voor Bella betekent dit dat zowel Duitsland als Hongarije de verantwoordelijkheid heeft om ervoor te zorgen dat hun nationaal contactpunt, Bella op haar verzoek, een antwoord zal moeten geven op haar vraag naar de juridische betekenis van een Nederlandse wilsverklaring in Duitsland en Hongarije. Tegen deze achtergrond stel ik in mijn onderzoek de volgende vraag. Wat is de meerwaarde van de patiëntenrichtlijn en meer specifiek van artikel 6, lid 3, in het omgaan met verschillen tussen EU-lidstaten in de bescherming van klassieke individuele patiëntenrechten. In hoofdstuk 2 onderzoek ik het klassieke begrip van individuele patiëntenrechten. Individuele patiëntenrechten vinden hun oorsprong in de bescherming van fundamentele mensenrechten. Dit betekent dat veel internationale mensenrechteninstrumenten en wetgeving van de Europese Unie van toepassing zijn. Hoewel dit zeer welkom is, garanderen al deze instrumenten niet dat de toepasselijke bepalingen ook succesvol worden omgezet in de nationale wetgeving van de lidstaten. Bovendien staan zowel internationale als EU-wetgeving de bestaande nationale verschillen toe. In hoofdstuk 3 onderzoek ik wat de meerwaarde van de richtlijn is ten opzichte van de al eerder bestaande internationale en EU-instrumenten. Uit mijn analyse volgt dat de richtlijn inderdaad een aantal klassieke patiëntenrechten geïntroduceerd heeft. Het is alleen teleurstellend dat de artikelen 4, 5 en 6 geen nauwkeurige weergave zijn van die klassieke patiëntenrechten. De meerwaarde van de richtlijn blijkt juist dat deze een aantal nieuwe, grensoverschrijdende elementen ten aanzien van klassieke patiëntenrechten heeft verzameld en een aantal nieuwe, individuele patiëntenrechten op informatie van de nationale contactpunten geïntroduceerd heeft. In hoofdstuk 4 gaat het verhaal van Bella verder. Hoe kan zij te weten komen of een Nederlandse wilsverklaring ook in Duitsland en Hongarije opgevolgd zou worden. Het antwoord luidt dat Bella eerst goed geïnformeerd moet zijn over het bestaan van de nationale contactpunten voor grensoverschrijdende zorg en wat zij voor haar kunnen betekenen. Verschillende studies laten zien dat het merendeel van de Europese Unie burgers niet op de hoogte is van de patiëntenrichtlijn en geen kennis heeft van het bestaan van de nationale contactpunten. Uit mijn proefschrift blijkt bovendien dat geen van de drie bestudeerde lidstaten het bestaan van hun contactpunt op grote schaal publiceert. De allereerste vraag moet daarom zijn, hoe kan Bella zich over het bestaan ervan informeren? De richtlijn gaat ervan uit dat Bella zichzelf informeert. 
Zij zal zelf actief op zoek moeten gaan naar informatie over het bestaan van de nationale contactpunten. Zo kan zij bijvoorbeeld enkele websites van de Europese Unie raadplegen. En het pdf-bestand van de Europese Commissie, met daaraan een overzicht van de verschillende nationale contactpunten. Opnieuw, dit veronderstelt wel dat zij daarvan op de hoogte is. En Bella kan zich natuurlijk ook altijd tot haar zorgverzekeraar, behandelend arts of tot een patiëntenorganisatie in Nederland richten, zodat zij haar kunnen doorverwijzen. Hoe kan Bella zich informeren over de geldende wetgeving in Duitsland en Hongarije? Bella kan het contactpunt in Duitsland en Hongarije onder andere via een website bereiken. Waar mogelijk zullen zij Bella antwoord geven op haar vragen in het Duits en Engels of in het Hongaars en Engels. Bella zal dus in een andere taal dan het Nederlands geïnformeerd worden. Uit mijn analyse blijkt dat zowel het contactpunt in Duitsland als Hongarije Bella zal informeren over haar klassieke patiëntenrechten in dat land. De informatievoorziening op hun, website, op hun website is echter heel minimaal. Bella's wilsverklaring zal juridisch gezien alleen van betekenis zijn als deze voldoet aan de vereisten voor rechtsgeldigheid in de Duitse of Hongaarse wetgeving. Mijn rechtsvergelijkende studie naar de wetgeving van Nederland, Duitsland en Hongarije toont aan dat de drie landen verschillen in hun formele vereisten. Zo is Bella op grond van de Duitse wetgeving verplicht haar wilsverklaring conform een voorgeschreven Duits format op te stellen. En volgens Hongaarse wetgeving kan haar wilsverklaring alleen dan juridisch bindend zijn als deze maximaal twee jaar geleden is opgesteld voor een notaris. De verantwoordelijkheid ligt dus grotendeels bij Bella. En ik vraag mij af of dit wel reëel is. In een ideale situatie is zij op de hoogte van het bestaan van de contactpunten voor grensoverschrijdende zorg. Maar de realiteit blijkt anders te zijn. Wanneer Bella niet op de hoogte is van hun bestaan en van haar rechten op informatie, kan dat vergaande gevolgen hebben. Een behandelend zorgverlener in Duitsland of Hongarije zal dan voor de vraag komen te staan of de gepresenteerde wilsverklaring rechtsgeldig is. En wanneer deze niet voldoet, dan zal Bella tegen haar wil in gerenimeerd worden. In hoofdstuk 5 vraag ik mij af of de lidstaten wel aan hun verantwoordelijkheden hebben voldaan. Is de minimale zichtbaarheid van de contactpunten voldoende? Is de minimale interpretatie van patiëntenrechten in artikel 6 lid 3 voldoende? En vooral die laatste vraag blijkt lastig te beantwoorden. Vanwege de grijze gebieden in de richtlijn en de ruimte voor de lidstaten om een eigen interpretatie van het begrip patiëntenrechten te geven. In mijn conclusie geef ik aan dat de patiëntenrichtlijn desalniettemin een nieuwe fase in de rechtsbescherming van klassieke individuele patiëntenrechten in de Europese Unie is. Bella's fictieve reis toont echter aan dat verbeteringen noodzakelijk zijn en dat artikel 6 lid 3 haar belofte nu niet waar kan maken. Het is allereerst belangrijk dat de Europese Unie en de lidstaten de kennis van de richtlijn en van het bestaan van de nationale contactpunten onder de bevolking vergroten. Een praktische aanbeveling is daarom het opnemen van een verwijzing naar de richtlijn en het bestaan van de contactpunten op de Europese zorgverzekeringskaart. Ik adviseer de Europese Unie ook in herziening van de richtlijn te overwegen. Specifiek is mijn advies om een EU-brede definitie van patiëntenrechten op te nemen en te zorgen voor verduidelijking van het begrip patiëntenrechten in artikel 6 lid 3. Cruciaal is wel dat de lidstaten bereid zijn om hun informatieverantwoordelijkheden op grond van de richtlijn te aanvaarden. Ik wijs de lidstaten ook graag op de wettelijke mogelijkheden voor verdergaande samenwerking tussen hun contactpunten. Samenwerking kan leiden tot een betere uitwisseling van informatie over de nationale wetgeving. En tot slot, 
Niet alle praktische, taalkundige problemen kunnen verholpen worden door informatieverstrekking. Nieuwe technologieën kunnen dan behulpzaam zijn bij de vertaling van een wilsverklaring naar de taal die de behandelende zorgverlener begrijpt. In effectieve toepassing van artikel 6 lid 3 op basis van deze aanbevelingen zal naar mijn mening leiden tot meer duidelijkheid over de verschillende niveaus van rechtsbescherming van klassieke patiëntenrechten in de lidstaten. En op de langere termijn zal dit vervolgens aanleiding geven tot een nieuw debat over de vraag of er meer Europese eenwording in de bescherming van klassieke patiëntenrechten zou moeten komen. Hartelijk dank voor jullie aandacht. Ik geef het woord graag terug aan de prorector. Thank you for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Professor van der Meijen, Professor of European Social Law at this university, and he was the chairman of the assessment committee. Professor van der Meijen. Thank you very much. Uh, dear candidates, uh, let me start by expressing my admiration for your work. You have done excellent research. You have written a wonderful book, which I have read with great interest. Thank you. Well done. Um, your book fills a niche in existing research, where virtually all other authors so far have focused on Chapter 3 of the Patient's Right Directive and the reimbursement of the cost of cross-border health care. You have decided to focus on Chapter 2 and the responsibilities of the member states, especially the member states where the treatment takes place, uh, as regards the, to the delivery of health care itself. Specifically, you focus on patients' rights and the duty of national contact points in the member states of treatment to offer proper information on healthcare providers, health and safety issues, and patients' rights. Uh, by focusing on these issues, you have indeed filled a gap in existing research. You have added something to the, um, no, what we already knew, let's say. And there are new things in your book. At the same time, your book and the findings of your research, of course, raise some questions. That's why I'm here. Um, and I'm not sure whether I fully understand you on all points. Um, I have two questions, and they are a little bit linked. Yeah, in fact, to the hardcore of your book, but concretely also to stelling number three, hmm? um, which states that the nature of Article 6.3 of the directive implies that a consistent definition of patients' rights in the directive is not only desirable, but also inevitable. As I said, I have two questions here. The first one is, basically Article 6.3 only concerns a duty to offer information on patients' rights. And the provision says nothing about the substance of these rights. So can you explain to me, to us, how a duty to provide information on patients' rights can lead to a substantive convergence of these patients' rights. The second question is a bit linked with, perhaps in follow-up. Um, you are of the opinion, which you also indicated now, that such a convergence is also desirable. But why? You can also reason differently. In the European Union, which is united in diversity, one could also argue that we should rather cherish the power or the prerogative of each member state to define patients' rights in the way that they deem best. Now, you may be tempted to say, ah, a move towards convergence facilitates the exercise of cross-border health care. Well, yeah, that may be true, but cross-border health care is small in size. Hmm? There are not so many patients who go to other member states, and that number is not likely to increase enormously in the near future, and I certainly do not hope that it will really increase. But should we then work on a convergence of, or a unification or a harmonization of patient rights for just a small group of people? Is it perhaps not better to accept and to cherish that there are some obstacles to cross-border um, healthcare, and that we can rather give each member state the prerogative and fully respect it, that they can define patients' rights in the way that they deem the best for the much bigger group of patients who is not going abroad. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm looking forward to your mm -hmm. response. Mm -hmm. Highly esteemed opponent, 
Thank you very much for your questions and thank you also for your kind words. Um, in terms of your questions, I would like to start with uh, addressing your uh, first question. So um, the first question uh, you raised is uh, related to uh, my third proposition in which I argue that uh, the nature of Article 6, Paragraph 3 um, makes it essential that a clear uh, definition is provided of the concept of patients' rights as well. And um, if I remember it correctly, your question focuses mainly on the substance of that concept of patients' rights. And um, in my dissertation, I am arguing that this concept of patients' rights in Article 6, Paragraph 3, really relates to the concept of classical individual patients' rights. And when I look at the title of Chapter 2 in the directive, it is stated the common responsibilities of the member states in the area of cross-border healthcare. And um, this chapter poses information responsibilities upon the member state of treatment in Article 4 and Article 6, Paragraph 3. And it also poses information responsibilities on the member state of affiliation in Article 5, and I believe also in Article 6, Paragraph 4. And when I have a closer look at the information responsibilities uh, for the member state of treatment uh, to ensure that their national contact point provides information on topics like healthcare providers, uh, patients' rights, um, how to deal with complaints, and the settlement of disputes, etc. I feel that um, this whole um, information responsibility um, refers much more to the concept of the classical individual patient's rights than to the modern social rights to reimbursement of the cost of cross-border healthcare. I think the information responsibilities upon the member state of affiliation in Article 5 are related to um, uh, information on the modern social rights to make that decision to travel to another member state and to uh, receive reimbursement of the costs. And for that reason, because, um, and also when I, when I go back to uh, the second chapter in my dissertation, in which I have focused on the classical notion of individual patients' rights, um, from my analysis, it becomes very clear that uh, although we have so many international human rights instruments and European Union legislation that is relevant for fundamental human rights and for patients' rights, there is still no definition of, um, of what we mean with referring to patients' rights. And um, also when I, when I go back to an expert presentation during the WHO uh, conference in the 90s, it was stated that um, in, in order to have the rights of patients respected, it is first of all required that we define the rights that patients have and also have a clear understanding of what we mean by them. And to me, that um, statement is today actually still very valid, also in light of Article 6, Paragraph 3. So when the European Union decides to create a directive on the application of patients' rights in cross-border healthcare, and the only reference to patients' rights in the directive is in Article 6, Paragraph 3, in my opinion, it, it would be very uh, logical also that the EU then comes up with the definition of what they mean with that term patients' rights. Um, did I answer your first question? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you, you may continue with the second one because I think it's yeah. a little bit linked. Yes. So, um, and. Um, your second question um, relates to, uh, I feel, the rationale behind the title of my uh, legal dissertation. So um, perhaps it is also good to, to start with emphasizing um, the aim of my dissertation is not to plead for uh, European convergence in classical individual patients' rights as such. Um, what I do argue for is that it is essential to create much more awareness 
of the existing differences between EU member states in their legislation of classical individual patients' rights. And um, I feel particularly in an area where the European Union wants to facilitate us as EU citizens to travel abroad for receiving safe and high quality uh, healthcare in that other member state, it is all the more important that EU citizens are aware of those existing differences. And this is in fact also reflected in the directive itself. Its preamble states multiple times that uh, appropriate information is essential for patients when they want to travel abroad for receiving medical care. And I feel it is also essential for a patient, like in my dissertation for Bella, to be very much aware of the fact that the legislation in Germany or Hungary with regard to a negative advance directive might be very different than the legislation we have in the Netherlands. Um, Overall, I feel the, the, the aim of my dissertation is to, to argue that there is great potential in Article 6, Paragraph 3. And when the European Union and the member states can ensure the effective application of Article 6, Paragraph 3, this will also result in more clarity and also more transparency over classical individual patients' rights regulations in the member states. But for individual patients, and maybe also in the end for national authorities, it will also become clear that there are differences. And for an individual patient, this means that when, when he or she travels abroad, uh, the patient's rights are maybe protected at, at a higher or a lower level um, of legal protection at home. And this, in the end, may lead to a debate on the question whether it um, would be uh, good to move in the future, and I don't think in the near future, but maybe in the, in the longer term, whether it is good to move towards a greater European convergence. But I feel, first of all, making information uh, much more available to individual patients is the first step to, to manage national divergence. Thank you. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Casabona, Professor in Law and Human Genome at the University of Giostio in Basque Country. Professor Casabona was also a member of the Assessment Committee, and we highly appreciate your participation to this academic ceremony. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. I thank Mr. Chair for your uh, uh, introduction. So first of all, of course, I would like to, to express my, my regret not to be able to be present with uh, all of you there at the University of Maastricht, but I had other, other duties here in my university this morning, early this morning. Well, I am very satisfied so, to participate in this uh, assessment uh, uh, committee, and uh, so I would like to to to, uh, to start uh, telling to the candidate, Mrs. Bongers, that uh, I enjoy reading the work presented by you, for uh, because the the main goal is uh, to study the directive 2011. Uh, the 24 uh, EU on the application of patient rights in cross border healthcare. This is a very, very important uh, question for the uh, exercise of the uh, patient's uh, rights. In particular, uh, uh, you pay attention to Article 6, uh, Paragraph 3, all the information to be provided by the the NCP of each member state of healthcare benefits. So I I I, would, I don't would like to be I don't, uh, to be more longer in relation with the explanation of your role, but uh, no, not only I enjoy, but also I consider that this is a very very important work that you you made uh, efforts to to. Uh, to find what uh, could be the novelties of this directive, but especially the 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 the, the uh, faults and the faults of uh, in relation with with uh, this uh, cross-border uh, healthcare. 
So I, I would like uh, so to, to address you uh, two questions as my colleagues. And so the first, the first one is in relation with a, a recommendation, your book, your work. And the, so I, uh, that you consider, the, you consider that uh, in order to better understand the rights included in this uh, Article 6, uh, Paragraph 3 the, 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 of the directive, so you, you think or you suggest that uh, the directive should incorporate a legal definition of individual patient's rights, which begins uh, begins as follows. I say your recommendation, and be your recommendation. Uh, in brackets, in order to enable patients to make uh, use of their rights in relation to cross-border healthcare and so on. So my, my question is whether this uh, definition of pa patient rights do, does not uh, seem justified in relation to this Article 6, Paragraph 3, as it only refers to patients' uh, rights related to to rights uh, concerning the provision of health care. And as you know, there are other patient rights that uh, are needed for, for uh, to be protected, uh, including in this uh, situation of cross-border health care. So I, I think that, uh, so is my question. If you consider that the a definition such as the one proposed, by you is not uh, sure, is sure or not sure that uh, will provide anything positive for understanding the scope of healthcare, which is a question of benefits that are covered by the states of origin. Uh, it would be my first question. I don't know, Mr. Chair, if I should uh, address also the second question or I, I have to wait uh, to the answer to the... I would suggest to first answer this question and then we can proceed with the second one, depending on the time. Thank you very much. Okay. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your question. Um, your question relates to um, my recommendation to um, provide more clarity in the directive itself on the concept of patients' rights in Article 6, Paragraph 3. And indeed, the, the uh, article uh, starts with uh, the sentence that it is essential to, uh, in order to enable patients to make use of their rights in relation to cross-border health care, the member state of treatment has to ensure that their national contact point provides a patient, among others, upon request with information on patients' rights. And um, when I go back to, to the analysis of uh, the concept of, of patients' rights in my second chapter, so um, patients' rights are a reflection of the importance of fundamental human rights. And with regard to patients' rights, more generally, a distinction can also be made between so-called modern social rights and the classical individual patients' rights. And um, if... Um, uh, Please correct me if I'm wrong, but if I understand your question correctly, um, you, you are of the opinion that, that the very first part is referring to the modern social rights to, to travel abroad for receiving medical care and also to, to ask your health insurance company for the reimbursement of those costs. And I feel that in the area of cross-border health care and also in, in health more in general, social rights and classical rights, they are very much connected uh, with each other. So in, in uh, yeah, individual rights, they, they generally uh, include negative obligations upon member states, whereas the so social rights uh, cover positive obligations upon member states to ensure that um, yeah, individuals as human beings can enjoy specific achievements of, of society in the area of healthcare, for example, the right to healthcare. And um, I think by, um, by including Bella's fictitious story in my dissertation, um, I aimed to, uh, to clarify also how her 
social rights to to make that decision to make use of her rights as an EU citizen to travel around the European Union for receiving medical care are also very much connected to um, yeah, making sure that her classical individual rights, in this case her right to a negative advance directive, are safeguarded in the area of cross-border healthcare as well. And so in order to make it possible that she can truly exercise her rights as an EU citizen to cross-border health care, it is also essential that her classical individual rights are guaranteed. And I see this Article 6, Paragraph 3 as a, a, a great uh, solution, also with respect to member states' national responsibilities, to leave it up to them to their national contact point to inform a citizen like Bella upon her own request on her classical individual patient's rights. We have time for a sh short question, second question. Is that possible, Professor Casabona? Uh, with all other uh, some related uh, uh, patient rights, one of uh, there is two parts. Uh, I refer so to to go uh, directly to the question to the matter is uh, as you know the the general rule uh, data protection of uh, 2016. Uh, is uh, really not only the, the, the data protection, but also by means of uh, artificial intelligence, AI. And especially this, uh, this general rule is a general regulation, uh, not only in relation with healthcare, but uh, other activities, technological activities, uh, enterprise activities, and so on. So, but uh, I think that uh, the, 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 the general rule on data protection has mm, very much to do with, with health, uh, healthcare and medical research and, and other related matters. So my question is, uh, uh, if you, you, you have uh, presented uh, the consideration of uh, uh, patient right in relation with healthcare, the right to information. And so I found it very, very, very adequate, your presentation of this. But uh, uh, what, uh, how you th uh, think that uh, should be uh, address the statement that uh, uh, is included in Article 22 of this uh, general rule? of 2016 when it uh, it uh, explains that uh, it, uh, it is dealing, dealing with uh, the right to an explanation of the procedural of the taking this decision by means of an automatic, automatized uh, AI system. So how, uh, so the question is how to do to accomplish with this, so to say, in brackets, rights of patients, uh, new rights maybe. And the second one is also related, uh, the second part of this question is also related with this uh, Article 22, where the, it states, and I think it is uh, very, very, very close to healthcare, as you is at the core of your of your work, of your uh, thesis. So uh, when it uh, it excludes. The, to take any decision, not only in the field of healthcare, but in other situations, but uh, our concern is here in, the, in this moment, healthcare, the, not to, to take any decision exclusively grounded on automat, uh, also automatized uh, way, so to, the, to say, uh, all or exclusively automatized. So this is my question. You can see that has uh, two two ways, but uh, the both uh, both are included in article article uh, 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 twenty two in relation with the directive two thousand eleven. Of course, uh, thank you very much. Short answer, when possible. Yes. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your next question. Um, I. Um, 
I'm not sure if I understood it correctly, but you are referring to Article 32 in a regulation coming from 2016. Yeah, 22. Oh, yeah, I am. Um, 22, yeah. So um, m maybe it's interesting f for me to have a, a short uh, or a quick broader look at the perspective of uh, the use of AI in relation to, to Bella's case. Um, and and uh, in addition, I am also aware of other developments within the European Union moving towards um, the connection of national contact points for e-health. And um, as far as I know, today, 11 member states, they have connected a national contact point for e-health to each other. And a part of their work is also to make it possible for healthcare providers in the different member states to have access to a patient summary. And this contact point uh, will make it, yeah, will ensure for the care provider that he or she has access to the patient summary in the language that he or she uh, speaks and understands. So also more broadly speaking, um, I'm, I'm not sure if I um, at, at this very moment know um, about the legal document that you are referring to, but to take that broader look, I think indeed AI can provide a very important tool to help patients in the area of cross-border healthcare. Okay, I believe we have to move forward now with the next uh, opponent, and that's Dr. Rial Sebak, Director of Research in CERM and Head of the Research Team Bioethics at the, an associate professor at Paul Sabatier University in Toulouse. Dr. Rial was also a member of the assessment committee, and of course also we highly appreciate your presence during this ceremony. Thank you very much, and dear candidate, we will start first to congratulate you for this very good piece of work. I have to say that I enjoyed it a lot and that it will be a major contribution also to our discipline, which is health law. And we know that we are a small community and we need to have young people involved in these kind of activities and these rich research activities. So again, uh, thank you for contributing to our um, domain and uh, thank you very much for this, uh, this work. Um, in your dissertation also you have uh, clearly overcame and you have just discussed that with the previous um, uh, opponent. Uh, what I have identified as the major challenge of your uh, work is to use these 2011 directive to discuss patients' rights. Also, this um, directive is more concentrated on social rights. So it was really a challenge and you made it. So again, uh, thank you for that. Um, I have also really appreciated that you have put the law in practice and uh, through this Bella's fiction, which is very important, I think, for lawyers as we are, uh, many of us, <laughs> I mean, uh, because of course you have done a very great analysis of the theoretical dimension of the thesis and all the questions that you have already um, that you have already addressed on the theoretical point of view but I think that we need also to identify what are the limits but also the benefits in practice for patients in the future and this is a huge contribution again for uh, of your work um, and by the end my last um, uh, comment uh, uh, will be uh, on the um, appreciated contribution also and the effort that you've made at the end of your dissertation providing recommendations and we all know here that this is very difficult to provide this kind of recommendation but you've made it so this is very courageous mm -hmm. so uh, and uh, I will start of course with one of your recommendations. And again, it's the one regarding the clarification of patients' rights under Article 6, Paragraph 3. And um, to follow up on what has been already uh, asked, um, you, are rec you are recommending uh, to clarify this patient's right and this right to information in particular in Article 6 
And uh, you, I, I was just wondering if you think that maybe you, we could go further mm -hmm. than only clarifying the directive or amending the directive. And as you have observed, probably, uh, all the new regulations that have been, all the texts that have been adopted at the EU level regarding health are regulation currently. And we are notably talking about the European health data space that will also build on this 2011 directive. So regarding the facilities and so on. So, I mean, there is a strong link. So don't you think that it should be also an option to go for a regulation more than only amending the directive? Do you think this is feasible? This is also, is it desirable also in terms of, do we need this kind of level of harmonization if we are talking about patients' rights? Or do you, we need to have a kind of diversity? So it will be my, my first question and I will go for the second after. Thank you. Dear esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your question and also for your kind compliments. Um, in relation to your question, you, um, you are asking me, um, whether uh, you are asking me about my views with regard to a potential um, change of this directive into a regulation, or whether I feel amending the directive uh, would be sufficient enough. Yes, and um, at this stage, I uh, and, and also uh, considering particularly the rather minimal interpretation and implementation by the EU member states of the directive, I feel that um, amending the directive and, and for example, by, by also uh, um, um, uh, ensuring much more clarity with regard to Article 6, Paragraph 3, that would already be a big step, I, I, I guess, uh, particularly since the member states are so, um, so much eager to, to uh, maintain their own uh, primary national competencies in the area of healthcare. And um, so I, I would not um, opt for uh, changing the directive into a regulation, but I, I really hope that, um, that the member states can accept their responsibilities under the directive. And uh, also when I, when I look back to the um, report published by the European Court of Auditors in 2019, and also the council conclusions in response to that report, I, uh, I've noticed that the member states are indeed very much aware of the fact that they need to invest much more in the visibility of their national contact points. And also given the report of the European Commission in, in May of this year, um, uh, um, it, it, yeah, um, both the European Commission, both the member states and also stakeholders at national level, they uh, are now putting their efforts together to um, make sure that the national contact points are uh, becoming much more visible across the European Union and its citizens. So I think that would already be a big step and I hope in addition the EU could maybe consider uh, a change of the directive. Thank you. I agree in a sense, but I think that there will be probably conflicts between the, what is currently discussed at the EU level for the European health data space and in relation with what is currently existing in this directive. So I think that there will be probably discussion. So my second question will be very brief. Um, you have, no, no, it will be brief. <laughs> um, uh, the we can keep your question for the second round. Is that okay? Oh, it's very short. Oh, very short then. Yes, thank you. Uh, so you have shown in chapter two that there are strong, strong links and influences between soft law ethics and health law, hard law. And you have done it uh, regarding at least research and biomedical research in particular. And I would like to have your views on this kind of movement, relationship between ethics, soft law and hard law, regarding what you have developed in your chapter five in uh, regarding new technologies, AI in particular. So what are your thoughts regarding these links between uh, ethics, soft law and hard law in new technologies? Thank you. 
short answer, please. Yes, I will answer shortly. Esteemed opponent, um, in my view, with regard to the soft law ethics documents, um, the uh, medical experts themselves who are, who are working in the area of healthcare, of daily medical practice, they are also the ones that are responsible for the drawing up of those ethical documents. And I feel also in relation to um, the increasing use of new technologies such as AI in healthcare, um, the experts coming from the field themselves, they can play a huge role in ensuring that those documents, codes of conduct, etc., are accepted as well in the field and thus in daily medical practice. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor De Wert, Professor of Ethics and of Reproductive Medicine and, gen and of Genetics at this university, and he is the secretary of the degree committee. Thank you, Pro-Rector. Uh, well, dear candidate, also accept my congratulations for your uh, highly interesting book. It regards uh, a relevant topic, no doubt. Uh, I must admit, though, as a non-lawyer, it was quite a challenge to read this huge volume, but well done. Um, I prepared a few questions, but let me focus on uh, one. Uh, which is linked with statement number seven. I'd like to ask one of your paronyms to speak up and read this statement. Voor een patiënt zal een zorgverlener met kennis van het gezondheidsrecht een geruststelling zijn. A health professional who has knowledge of health law is a reassurance to a patient. Thank you. So it's, it's clear for all, I think, that yes, according to the, the candidate, um, voor een patiënt zal een zorgverlener met kennis van het gezondheidsrecht in geruststelling zijn. Ja, yeah. maybe, yes, sure, sure. A lack of any legal knowledge is definitely not an advantage. I think we all agree. But still, I'd like to invite you to reflect on some possible amendments uh, regarding your statement, and for reasons of the time constraints, I'll focus on just two possible amendments. First, what strikes me is that uh, the knowledge of health law you are referring to uh, is linked, obviously, with a cognitive capacity. And my question is, do you think that this is sufficient? I can imagine that there are some other partly non-cognitive uh, components of the normative competency that we all agree is important. A few other elements apart from this cognitive aspect. Is it just about knowledge of all these rules? Mm. Is that what is what creates trust, what is reassuring? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your question. Mm, first of all, um, yes, I am really convinced that when a healthcare professional has knowledge of health law, and then in this, in this uh, way, maybe also focusing on my own experiences uh, in teaching health law and health ethics at the university. It, it, it is really so beneficial in the relationship between a uh, uh, healthcare um, professional and the patient. In addition, it is not only about knowledge of health law, it is also about indeed um, cognitive uh, capacity of the healthcare professional, but also being aware of the importance of communication with your patient and of establishing a, a relationship with your patient that is built upon trust, mutual trust, especially. Yeah. What I'm particularly uh, thinking of is uh, the virtue of practical wisdom mm -hmm. in Aristotelian ethics. Uh, practical wisdom, meaning that we expect all of us, and particularly medical professionals to be able to not only apply general rules, but also to identify possible lacunas in normative reflections, including lacunas or deficiencies in the law. W what do you think? Mm. Is, isn't this a crucial element uh, which really founds trust in medical doctors? 
Yes, well, highly esteemed opponent. Yes, I think um, it is very important uh, that uh, uh, the health professionals themselves are able to also detect specific lacunas in the legislation because uh, in the end it comes down to the application of legislation in daily medical practice and I think also in this regard the yeah. um, the uh, added value of soft law instruments is very very uh, essential and this is something that I consider yeah. also to be no. relevant within okay. the context of okay. my okay. proposition. You seem to emphasize the application component which presumes, maybe, that law is seen as some sort of as a given. I would rather argue it's not just a given, it is a highly dynamic entity, it's a living body, so to say. <laughs> and uh, uh, one of the founding fathers of health law in the Netherlands, you know very well, Henk Lenen, he made a crucial distinction between two types of law, the delega lata, the given law, the positive law, mm -hmm. Uh, or uh, het vigerende recht, to say in Dutch, and on the other hand, the de lega ferenda in Latin, which is the ideal law, the law as it should be. Mm. And my question, my last uh, question is, do you agree that when it comes to the articulation of this de lega ferenda component, that it's crucially important for lawyers to engage in a debate with citizens, but also with ethicists. Yes, yes. We yes. agree. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> that yes. was a very short answer. <laughs> very, very, very short. It's a, uh, also an answer which raises uh, a lot more issues, but we may have some further opportunities to engage in the discussion. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I will Thank suggest you. that we move for forward with the last uh, opponent, and that's Dr. Clemens, lecturer in, in European Public Health at this university. Thank you very much, dear Prorector. First of all, I would like to join uh, to congratulate you, your family, and your supervisors uh, for this achievement and uh, the quality of piece of research in, in the area of, of patient rights. I nevertheless would like to exchange quickly uh, on a few aspects and I would like to continue the discussion on convergence uh, with you. Your, your title of the thesis suggests um, that you may want to uh, investigate whether there is a convergence effect by the, by the directive. Your research question then rather moves a little bit away in, in terms of thinking about oh, how can I manage di diversity. So I think you try to avoid in principle, or it was not your intention to look if there is convergence understanding as a decrease of variation in p patient rights overall. Nevertheless, the literature on, on the concept of convergence pr provides alternative viewpoints on, on convergence. For example, while there is no convergence in terms of reducing variation, could we have seen an upwards move of patient rights level overall, remaining a, a stable variation, but nevertheless, we have moved up the level of, of patient rights overall, or alternatively, if you would say there are no if there are no effects on convergence as 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 out as outcome or effects, do we see convergence in terms of models of patient rights or processes have certain ways to ensure uh, patient rights become on vogue, so to say? If I would think of, for example, the right to second opinion, um, the request towards member states to, to publish um, quality indicators of institutions or individual uh, providers of, of care. So I would like you to reflect on that and as well on do you see a role, has the directive play in, a role in that? 
Dear esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your questions. Um, maybe it's good to uh, go back to your last question first, whether I see a role for the directive in, um, in moving towards more uh, convergence uh, in the levels of legal protection of classical individual patients' rights. Yes, absolutely. I see a role for the directive. Um, but um, the role of the directive is, um, is, is not such a big role as I have seen with regard to the Biomedicine Convention of the Council of Europe that was uh, adopted at the end of the 90s. And um, uh, several uh, Eastern European countries have signed and ratified that Biomedicine Convention. And after signing and ratifying that Biomedicine Convention, patients' rights legislations were uh, put into force in those Eastern uh, European countries. And this is really a, a very big step that um, was taken with the Biomedicine Convention. So uh, comparing the Biomedicine Convention with the directive, the directive is also a legally binding instrument, but the directive is legally binding as to the results to be achieved. So it is left to the yeah, 27 EU member states and the EEA countries to decide um, how they want to interpret uh, uh, specific provisions of the directive. So there is a lot of room for the member states themselves. Still, I think with regard to uh, the inclusion of the provisions in chapter two. You may finish oh, your answer. Yes, thank you. Um, with regard to the provisions in, uh, in chapter two, um, the very fact that they are now included in a legally binding document can and, and I hope will definitely lead to more convergence. Okay. Thank you very much. I hand back to the, you, for the pro rector. Lisette Bongers, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off
outside. Ten miles in my rearview mirror. I know what it felt like. My goal's only getting clearer. East side to the west side. No place like home. If it's questions that you've got, go the extra mile and die. Mm -hmm. Long road to the south side. Mm -hmm. Ten miles in my rearview mirror. I know what it felt like. Mm -hmm. My goal's only getting clearer. East side to the west side. Mm -hmm. No place like home. Mm -hmm. If it's questions that you've got, go the extra mile.
Lisette Bongers. The degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense in view of its positive verdict and taken into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Townend is authorized to confirm upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. I must first ask you two qu a question. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, and remotely, <laughs> I hereby confer upon you, Lisetta Maria Hubertina Bongus, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the pro-rector, rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. I was going to try and do this in Dutch, but I think we'll all get out earlier and with more understanding if I stick to Yorkshire, uh, your English. Uh, dear Dr. Bongus, uh, how good it is to be able to say that. Oh. And to congratulate you on behalf of uh, Hermann, Ranki, and myself. Uh, Hermann sends his, his apologies. He's, he's ill and cannot uh, be here today, but... Uh, he, he, he sends his congratulations. This has been quite a journey. At the outset, it seemed like a relatively easy question, an easy PhD question, if there is such a thing. How do patient rights operate across borders within the European Union? But as with all good PhD questions, it had many twists and turns, almost from the day we started. First, the whole project hangs on the EU legislation on cross-border patient rights. And as we've heard and explored today, that legislation has never been clear, either practically or conceptually. Even when, early on in your research, we spoke to an official in the Commission who oversaw the development of the directive, we didn't get a clear answer about what was intended or why the legislation was formed in that way or in the first place. Only an understanding that this was politics, and politics that were contested amongst the member states. And then, as with, all new EU, uh, with any new EU directive, it took time for the directive to be implemented in the member states, a long time. And we must remember, this is part of a very small group of legislation that expressly states within the text that the intention is not to encourage anyone to use it. We have national contact points, but as you've shown, what they say is not harmonized. It's a good job that the project didn't have an experimental aspect to take Bella as a real person around the EU to see what treatment that she would get and to what reimbursement she'd be entitled. I fear very much for the health of Bella had we tried such an experiment. You were also able to join the Institute of Data Science and amongst other questions to explore whether data science could provide some help in developing patient rights. 
an exciting development for us who wish to advance patient rights, it remains to be seen whether legislators will share your and our enthusiasm. And you've produced a def and defended a very fine traditional law PhD dissertation, and today we celebrate that achievement. But as with all good PhD projects, this has not only been an academic journey about the project, it's been a great privilege for us at your supervisory, advisory team to accompany you on your broader journey. Throughout your PhD studies, you've taught. You've become an excellent and highly respected teacher, very much at home in the lecture hall and very importantly in the seminar and workshop room. You're able to get alongside students to help them to explore the intriguing, often confusing, and never straightforward world of health law. You expect very high standards from them, uh, the high standards that you expect from yourself. You want them to explore the detail of the law in the same way that you have a wonderful, strong commitment to studying the law, understanding the detail of the law but you are approachable and fair, and that makes you a well-respected and well-liked lecturer. You are a specialist in health law with a particular gift and enthusiasm for teaching students seeking admission to that other great profession, medical students. I'm sure that there are many jokes and anecdotes that we lawyers could draw upon at this point about the rivalry between the two professions, but we are FHML, of course, so we are above such things. <laughs> and of course, the speech wouldn't be complete without anecdotes about the candidate. <laughs> um, first, and this is not an amusing anecdote, but uh, an observation. Your family means so much to you and have been an amazing support to you throughout this journey. The bond between you is very clear and wonderful to see even from the distance of the university. Congratulations to you for Lisette's achievement and your very great part in it. We will fondly remember trips to Leuven for supervisions in Hellman's office in the hospital there. A hospital, it must be said, that is quite strange because you never see any patients. It's just an office for health law and then lots of empty wards. Um, remembering the train was uh, probably less frightening than remembering my driving. Uh, but the train isn't always as reliable, well, not always as reliable, but anyway. And I will remember that I don't think I have ever managed to tell a joke that you found funny. Um, always because you see the humanity in the plight of the butt of the joke. I know that some of those Les Dawson classics about mothers-in-law are of their time. Uh, but I did think that I was okay with the one about the chap who goes for a job at the blacksmiths. Uh, they ask if he has any experience in shoeing horses. And he says, no, but I was once very rude to a donkey. But alas, no. Um, but that's you, Lisette. You care about people and donkeys. And that is what makes you a great health lawyer and a great academic. You're driven by questions of fairness and justice. And that's why your thesis is of such quality and why you are such a wonderful part of the department and the university. So, on this very special day, it is our great pleasure and privilege to congratulate you and your family and friends on your doctorate. And to say again, well done, Dr. Bongas. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dear Dr. Bongers, also on behalf of the Maastricht University and the Board of Deans, I congratulate you with this acquired degree of doctor, and the university wish you all the best in your further career. 
Ik wil nu vragen aan het publiek om het auditorium te verlaten. Wij zullen hier in het auditorium nog een foto maken samen met uh, onze collega uh, die online aanwezig is. En vervolgens zullen we een foto maken op de trap in de, in de centrale hal van het universiteitsgebouw. En hiermee sluit ik deze academische zitting.